Everywhere we go, Mormons and unfortunately Christians are saying, why are you persecuting these Mormon people? Now to answer that question, I hope I've made it very clear that we're not here to attack Mormon people. We, we are not here to destroy their faith. We want to transfer their faith to a Jesus who has the power to save. Now, in key, we have a scripture, uh, scripture to guide our ministry, which is Proverbs 18:19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. We will not reach Mormons by laughing at them. We will not reach Mormons by being sarcastic about them, by ridiculing them, creating jokes at their expense nor will we reach them by slamming their, the door in their face. In keeping with our ministry guideline, we ask that there be no laughter during this movie. That laughter would be at the expense of Mormon people, and if there are Mormons here tonight, that would offend them deeply. And we don't want you laughing or snickering uh, because of information in the movie. Now, to answer the question, why are we here? We'd like to show you some slides from Mormon leaders regarding, first of all, their view of Christianity. If we could uh, kick these lights uh, up in the front here, it would help. On the left, we have a statement from Apostle John Taylor, who later became the third president of the Mormon Church. This is from the Journal of Discourses says, we talk about Christianity, but it is a perfect pack of nonsense. It is a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It is as corrupt as hell, and the devil could not invent a better engine to spread his work than the Christianity of the 19th century. Brigham Young, who was the president of the church at that time, commenting on these remarks, says, Brother Taylor has just said that the religions of the day were hatched in hell. The eggs were laid in hell, hatched on its borders, and then kicked on to the earth. In a pamphlet or tract that the Mormon missionaries pass out today, it's very current. It's called, What the Mormons Think of Christ, we find the following. Christians speak often of the blood of Christ and its cleansing power. Much that is believed and taught on this subject, however, is such utter nonsense and so palpably false that to believe it is to lose one's salvation. For instance, many believe or pretend to believe that if we confess Christ with our lips and avow that we accept him as our personal savior, we are thereby saved. They say that his blood without any other act than mere belief makes us clean. And of course, they are attacking that position. In the authorized version of the first vision story, and I emphasize the authorized version because I have studied eight different versions in great detail, and there are major contradictions between the various versions. But in the authorized version, in the Pearl of Great Price, it has Joseph Smith saying the following, I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which of all the sects was right for at this time it had never entered into my heart that all were wrong in which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt. The, wor the use of the word all in this description takes care of everything and everybody in Christianity. To bring it very current, on January 10th, 1984, and I'll just read to you from the Provo, Utah paper, The Herald, it says, Elder Bruce R. McConkie, an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, called the doctrine of salvation by grace without works the second greatest heresy of Christianity during Brigham Young University's opening devotional Tuesday. The first great heresy, he said, pertains to the nature of God, the doctrine of the Trinity. How many of you here tonight believe in the doctrine of the Trinity? Most of you. For those of you who raised your hands, we are here to represent you as a Christian ministry of defense because it is clear Mormonism is attacking 
Christianity. Secondly, we're here by invitation from Mormon leaders. This is from Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith, the 10th president of the Mormon Church, and he says, Mormonism, as it is called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly appointed and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds this world has ever seen. There is no middle ground. If Joseph Smith was a deceiver who willfully attempted to mislead the people, then he should be exposed. His claims should be refuted, and his doctrines shown to be false. For the doctrines of an impostor cannot be made to harmonize in all particulars with divine truth. If his claims and declarations were built upon fraud and deceit, there would appear many errors and contradictions which would be easy to detect. The doctrines of false teachers will not stand the test when tried by the accepted standards of measurement, the scriptures. From Apostle Orson Pratt, who lived at the time of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, the following, If we cannot convince you by reason nor by the word of God that your religion is wrong, we will not persecute you. We ask from you the same generosity. Protect us in the exercise of our religious rights. Convince us of our errors of doctrine if we have any. By reason, by logical arguments, or by the word of God, and we will be ever grateful for the information, and you will ever have the pleasing reflection that you have been instruments in the hands of God of redeeming your fellow beings. From George Albert Smith, who was a counselor to Brigham Young in the presidency, the following, If a faith will not bear to be investigated, if its preachers and professors are afraid to have it examined, their foundation must be very weak. And finally, from Brigham Young, I say to the whole world, receive the truth, no matter who presents it to you. Take up the Bible, compare the religion of the Latter-day Saints with it, and see if it will stand the test. Tonight, we accept that invitation. We're going to take up the Bible, we're going to compare the religion of the Latter-day Saints with it and see if it will stand the test. Well, now what do we do? The missionaries are standing at your front door. Do you slam the door in their face or tell them to get lost and say unkind things to them? Absolutely not. Because when that happens, and unfortunately it happens often, according to the missionaries that I talk to, it confirms to them that they're doing the right thing and they work harder doing it. When I left the Mormon Church and wrote my testimony letter to my family and friends, my objective in writing that letter was to get my own family and friends to read some of the same material I had read and tell me if I'd made a mistake. Because my eternal life is at stake. And even after I drove a thousand miles from Bakersfield to Kennewick and Richland, Washington, and gave the books to my brothers, one of my, my younger brother is a bishop in Kennewick, Washington. My older brother was, was, the eld, was uh, in the Elders Quorum Presidency at the time. He's now 70 doing missionary work. And I gave them the books. And I checked back with them several months later, and I said, how are you doing? And they said, we don't have time to read all this material. And I realized that they were telling me some truth. They don't have the time to spend like I did to read all this material. My younger brother's a bishop. He's the father of six small children. He's a school teacher. My older brother's a school teacher, very active in musical circles, and they just don't have time, and most people don't have time to read all this material. So I decided that I would reduce the heresy of Mormonism down to the irreducible. You've seen a lot of heresy in this movie. Most of it is irrelevant. The relevant issue is, is if you've got the wrong God and the wrong Jesus, then everything else is irrelevant. Because if you're worshiping any God other than the one true God, you're worshiping an idol. And if you're worshiping an idol, it will bring you spiritual death. So I spent about a year compiling some research together, and I wrote a second letter to my family and friends. This second letter has become so useful to Christians in witnessing to Mormons 
that we now have it available. It's a 35-page letter, single space, small type, with an awful lot of information in it. There's a cover sheet on the front of it giving instructions on how to use the material in this letter. This is such a simple method of witnessing to Mormons, we even call it the KISS method of witnessing to Mormons. Some of you might know the KISS method. Keep it simple, saint. Not the other version. This is the Christian version. Keep it simple, saint. Four simple questions that you can ask a Mormon based on the answers that you will get you can make two observation statements to the Mormon and a reasonable rational Mormon should realize that they're going to have to do some further checking first question that you can ask a Mormon is your God a glorified resurrected exalted man and the Mormon will say yes second question is your Jesus the spirit brother of Lucifer? And they will say, yes, we all are. Now at that point, all you need to do as a Christian is to make an observation statement to them and say, well, that means we're worshiping a different God in the name of another Jesus, and we can't both be right, can we? One of us has got to be wrong. Would you agree? And they agree because they feel very confident in what they've been taught by their leaders. Third question who taught you that God is a glorified, resurrected, exalted man? Where did that come from? Now, the answer to that is Joseph Smith, and you might need to guide them to that answer. They might say, well, I learned it in, at BYU or institute or seminary or Sunday school, or my parents taught it to me. So you might need to guide them to that answer. Once you get agreement, yes, it was Joseph Smith who taught this, then you make your second observation statement and say, well, that means that if Joseph Smith is a true prophet, I'm worshiping the wrong God. Now, the Mormon will get excited when they hear you say that because they'll see convert written right across your forehead. But then you finish it and say, but if Joseph Smith is a false prophet, you're worshiping the wrong God. Would you agree? And they agree because they feel very confident in what they've been taught by their leaders. Last question. Have you tested Joseph Smith to determine whether he's a true prophet or a false prophet? Now, the Mormons have not done this, by and large, and so what you normally get in return to that question is their testimony. They'll say, well, I've studied it, I've prayed about it, and I testify to you that Joseph Smith is a true prophet. And they're very powerful in their testimony. They might include other things, like in about the Book of Mormon or Spencer W. Kimball being the living prophet today or something else. Whenever a Mormon bears you their testimony, you might tell them a story that's on the cover page of the instruction sheet. The whole purpose of this story is to get the Mormon to realize you can't trust your feelings. I've taken this story from a wonderful book titled Full Assurance by uh, Harry Ironside, one of the great Christian teachers and preachers of years past. And I've changed it slightly to make it apply to Mormonism. But it's a very simple little story. Three men dying, and the first man on his deathbed, Satan appears to him and he says, you belong to me. The man says, oh no, I've had many years of wonderful spiritual experiences, and I've studied, and I've prayed, and I have a burning testimony that I'm doing the right thing. And Satan looks at him and responds and says, I counterfeited all of those feelings and experiences. Now to the Mormon, if that's where your testimony comes from, could you prove that it was not Satan that counterfeited those feelings and experiences? second man dying and Satan appears to him and he says you belong to me and the man says oh no an angel of light appeared to me and told me that I was saved or my great great grandmother appeared to me in the temple and told me I was doing the right thing and Satan responds and says I appeared as the angel of light or one of my associates appeared as your great great grandmother now to the Mormon if that's where your testimony comes from stories like that, whether they happen to you or other people. Could you prove that it was not Satan that appeared or one of his demon spirits? 
third man dying and Satan appears to him and says you belong to me and the man smiles and he says it is written for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life I am a whosoever now of the three men which would you vote for as having full assurance of eternal life you see Feelings and experiences can be important. But if they don't harmonize with what is written in God's holy word, there's no light in it, Isaiah 8.20. It is crucial that the Mormon understand that they have got to test Joseph Smith to determine whether he's a true prophet or whether he's a false prophet. My whole thesis on this 35-page letter is that if you can show that Joseph Smith is a false prophet, then Mormonism crumbles. I've listed four ways of testing Joseph Smith, four scriptures to test Joseph Smith. Two from the Bible, most importantly, two from Mormon scripture. The first scripture in the Bible dealing with testing a prophet is Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 to 5. The issue, other gods. We've already established with the Mormon that we're worshiping different gods. So let's go to the next one. Deuteronomy 18, verses 20 to 22. The issue, if the prophet says one thing in the name of the Lord and that thing, singular, doesn't come to pass, you've got a false prophet. Now let's go to Mormon scripture. They have a scripture book called The Doctrine and Covenants. Section 1, verse 37 says, Search these commandments, for they are true and faithful, and the prophecies and promises which are in them shall all be fulfilled. And section 3, verse 3 says, Remember, remember that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. So if you can find one prophetic utterance of Joseph Smith that has not been true and faithful, that has been frustrated, that has not come to pass, and it can never come to pass, a reasonable, rational person really interested in truth, should be able to, to understand you're dealing with a false prophet. In this letter, I have listed in detail, chronologically, 53 prophetic utterances of Joseph Smith that have not come to pass. At least 38 of them can never come to pass. The language does not permit it. Let me give you just a couple of examples. There are seven of them in the list that deal with the subject called Zion. In July of 1831, Joseph Smith receives a revelation, Verily thus saith the Lord, Independence, Missouri is Zion. Section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants receives September 22nd and 23rd, 1832. Joseph Smith receives another revelation. He says, Verily thus saith the Lord, and I'm paraphrasing, Build a temple in Zion. Build it on the lot appointed by the finger of the Lord. Build it in the generation now living, the generation of 1832, and Joseph Smith, you dedicate it. They have never built that temple in independence. The lot appointed by the finger of the Lord is now owned by an apostate group from the Mormon church known as the Church of Christ Temple Lot. They plan on building their own temple there. They won't sell it for any amount of money. All the people living in 1832 are dead by declaration of Joseph Fielding Smith in answers to gospel questions. And Joseph Smith is dead. He can't dedicate it. There is no way to escape the reality that that is a false prophecy. The very least that you can say about it is that it has been frustrated. Therefore, it's not from God. It's from the mind of man. But Joseph Smith said, Verily, thus saith the Lord. Finally, on August 16, 1834, Joseph Smith says, Two years from September 11th next is the appointed time for the redemption of Zion. Zion has never been redeemed. September 11th, 1836 came and went. It's never been redeemed. Now, if you can go through six or eight of these with a Mormon, and there's some in here that are absolutely devastating. If you can go through six or eight of these with a Mormon, and they look you in the eye, and with strong emotion, they say, I don't care if they all don't come to pass. I testify that Joseph Smith is a true prophet. And they go into their testimony. 
When that happens, you are watching a person in the process of self-hypnosis. When the ear hears what the mouth says enough times, the mind will believe. And from the time Mormons are little children, they first join the Mormon church, they are urged by peer pressure to bear their testimony. And the first time you bear your testimony as a young Mormon boy, you come back and you sit down and your parents got tears in their eyes and they give you hugs and kisses and if you're like me, they take you to Fenton's for ice cream after. And you do something good in the church and you go to Fenton's. I wish they hadn't have taken me to Fenton so much. But when this happens, when they bear you their testimony, after you have given them the evidence, then, I say, let's take them to God's Word and see what we're dealing with. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. And in the King James it reads, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a what? A lie. That they should believe a lie. What lie? What is the greatest lie ever told to mankind? You shall become a god or shall become as the gods. The greatest lie ever told by the greatest liar who has ever existed. John 8:44. what does it say regarding Satan? He was a murderer from the beginning. He abode not in the truth. There is no truth in him. And what a tragedy. Mormons believe that Satan told the truth in the Garden of Eden. They say that Adam fell, but he fell upward toward the mark, toward Godhood. What a tragedy. Turn to 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who is the God of this world? Satan. The God of this world is Satan. And when you go through the Mormon temple ceremony and analyze it just in terms of Lucifer's role of the temple ceremony, it becomes indelibly clear who the God of Mormonism really is. You can buy a book. It's called What's Going On in There? Now, we've just come from Albuquerque, and we were wiped out in Albuquerque, but there's more coming. We'll probably have them tomorrow night or one of the later nights this week, but we'll have some at these showings. Or you can fill out one of the orange cards and, and order it, and we'll be happy to send it. It's the entire Mormon temple ceremony almost word perfect and you can get a tape recording of the ceremony to back it up in clear-cut understandable language in the temple ceremony in the Garden of Eden scene there's a man playing the part of Adam who meets a man playing the part of Lucifer and Lucifer is wearing an apron tied around his waist and Adam says what is that apron you have on and Lucifer arrogantly says, it is an emblem of my power and priesthoods. Fifty-eight words later, after they hear the voice of Elohim, Mormons know Elohim is their God, they hear him coming, Lucifer excitedly and slyly turns to Adam and Eve and says, see you're naked, take some fig leaves and make you aprons, Father will see your nakedness, quick, hide. And Adam says, come, let us hide. And the movie stops that you're watching in most of the temples, in the Salt Lake Temple, it's still live actors. But in the, the movie stops and the narrator of the temple ceremony stands before the people and he says, brethren and sisters, put on your aprons. And everyone stands up and puts on the apron. Now whose instruction was it to do that? Satan's. Satan instructed them to do that. Quick, 
See, you're naked. Take some fig leaves. And under his instruction, they are instructed to, to tie on the apron. And everybody stands up and ties it on. They wear it through their temple ceremony. They wear it when they're married, and they're wearing it when they're buried. They're also wearing it when they're ushered through the veil of the temple, which the Mormons have hung back up after God opened it up forever. When Jesus was crucified, what did he say? It is finished. And what happened to the veil in Herod's temple? Rent from the top to the bottom, 60 feet high, about 8 inches thick, opening up access to God through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who becomes the last high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And because he lives forever, he hath an unchangeable priesthood, Hebrews 7.24. And the Mormons have hung the veil back up and they've put holes in it. And through these holes, you go through a ritual, sticking your arms through the holes and receiving secret handshakes and giving secret names. And finally, upon the five points of fellowship, you can go through the veil wearing that apron. And it's not God that you're going into the presence of, not the one true God, because God rejected that. God rejected the, the fig leaf. And animals were slain and their skins were made into coverings to cover their nakedness to cover their sin and this is the first arrow pointing to Jesus Christ and the shedding of blood being necessary to cover the sin without the shedding of blood there's no remission of sin Hebrews 9 2 2 what a tragedy that they're even involved in this this ritual like this a little bit later in the temple ceremony, Adam is praying to the Mormon God, and he says, O oh God, hear the words of my mouth three times. Lucifer answers his prayer. Now that should immediately raise a red flag in any thinking person's mind to realize you're praying to your God, but Lucifer answers your prayer. And Lucifer says, I hear you. What is it you want? And Adam says, surprised, who are you? I am the God of this world, he says arrogantly. You the God of this world? Yes, what do you want? I am looking for messengers. And then Lucifer with a smug, wise grin says, Oh, I see. You want someone to preach to you. You want religion, do you? I will have preachers here presently. And then a preacher appears and he says, Good morning, a fine congregation. And Lucifer says, Yes, they're very good people. They're concerned about religion. Are you a preacher? I am. Have you been to college and received training for the ministry? Certainly a man cannot preach unless he has been trained for the ministry. Do you preach the orthodox religion? Yes, that is what I preach. If you will preach your orthodox religion to these people and convert them, I'll pay you well. I'll do my best, the preacher says. And every time you go through the endowment ceremony of the Mormon temple ceremony, you learn and relearn that all Christian preachers are in the employment of Lucifer. Now listen very carefully to what the preacher does next. He turns to Adam and Eve and with dramatic gestures he says, I am glad to know that you are calling upon Father. Do you believe in a God who is without body parts and passions, who sits on the top of a topless throne, whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, who fills the universe and yet is so small that he can dwell in your heart, who is surrounded by myriads of beings who have been saved by grace, not by any act of theirs, but by his good pleasure? Do you believe in this great being? Who has he just described? God. The Christian God, and I can give you a scripture for every one of those parts. He has accurately described the Christian God, and Adam, representing all of Mormonism, emphatically says, I do not, I cannot comprehend such a being. And the preacher wistfully says, that is the beauty of it. Then reproachfully he says, perhaps you do not believe in the devil and in that great hell, the bottomless pit where there is a lake of fire and brimstone into which the wicked are cast, and where they are continually burning but are never consumed. Accurately describing hell. And Adam, representing all of Mormonism, says emphatically, I do not believe in any such place. And every time you go through the endowment ceremony of the Mormon temple ceremony, you learn and relearn and watch a mocking dialogue attacking the Christian God. 
Now, for those of you who raised your hands earlier tonight, I want to reemphasize we're here to represent you as a Christian ministry of defense because it should be very clear to you Mormonism is attacking the very foundation of what you believe. To the Mormons that are here that saw the people raise their hands, this is the issue. Either these people who raised their hands are worshiping the wrong God or you are worshiping the wrong God. There's no escaping the reality that one of us is wrong. Now, finally, just before Lucifer gets kicked out of the temple ceremony, they make it look really good. They're going to kick him out. He turns to the camera lens and he looks right at you as if he's looking right into your eyes. And with sinister, language, or sinister approach and vehemence, he says, I have a word to say concerning these people. If they do not walk up to every covenant they make at these altars in this temple this day, they will be in my power. One of the covenants that they swear in the temple is to obey the law of obedience. It is by strict obedience to every commandment and ordinance and law, according to Mormonism, that you make it. Last year, I bought a new book in Salt Lake City called Commandments and Promises of God by Bernard P. Brockbank. In this book, he has listed over 4,300 commandments. According to section 131, verse 6 of the Mormon Doctrine and Covenants, the Mormon must know every one of those commandments because 131, verse 6 says, it is impossible to be saved in ignorance. So you've got to know them, you've got to obey them. If you break one of them, you've broken all of them, according to James. If you're a temple Mormon and you break one of them, you have just placed yourself under the power of Satan by your own temple ceremony. What we as Christians have to do is contrast the incredible, complex, impossible gospel of Mormonism with the simplicity and beauty of the gospel as written in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3b and 4. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's no laws and ordinances in it. In fact, what does it say in Colossians? The ordinances were nailed to the cross with Jesus. Now, we're down to where the rubber meets the road. You can have a head knowledge of the gospel and be totally lost. You can profess Christ and not possess Christ. You can come and play church every Sunday and be as lost as lost can be. You've got to do something with the head knowledge of the gospel. And there's one word that weaves all the way through scriptures as to what you have to do. Believe it. John 3.16, John 3.36, John 5.24, Romans chapter 10, on and on and on. Believe it. And the Mormon says, you mean all I have to do is believe it and I'm saved and then I can go out and live it up and party and have a good time? God forbid, it says. You're trampling on grace when you do that because there's something called the judgment seat of Christ where all Christians will stand before Christ, they will either lay crowns at his feet and receive rewards, or they will stand ashamed because of the sort of work they did. They'll be saved as if by fire, but no rewards. And I believe one of the reasons that Christians will stand ashamed at that day is because of the lost opportunities to witness to people that you absolutely knew were going to their eternal destruction. I lived my entire lifetime as a Mormon with many wonderful Christian friends. Never once did any of my Christian friends witness Jesus to me. Never once did any of my Christian friends tell me I was involved in a counterfeit Christian religion. Fortunately, God reached down and plucked me out now, there may be someone here tonight that God is speaking to you. Do you have that assurance that if you go out this door tonight and you're killed on the way home, that you have eternal life? 
Or if you're a Mormon and you go out that door tonight and you're killed on the, on the way home and you believe that God is a glorified, resurrected, exalted man and Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, if you're killed on the way home tonight, you're twice dead. Dead in the flesh and dead in the spirit. Now you can prevent that from happening. If you don't know whether you have the assurance of eternal life, talk to me after. We'll talk to you privately. Talk to Pastor Dykeman. Talk to any of our people here uh, in the ministry, and we'll talk to you privately and settle that issue once and for all. Recently I heard a Marine Lieutenant speak in Redding, California. He was born in a Christian family. He was baptized. He had gone to church all of his life. And in a foxhole in Vietnam, he discovered that he hadn't met Jesus in all of his life. And he asked Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior in that foxhole. And he told a story when he spoke in Reading. And he said, he told a story about a uh, World Series baseball game. I believe it was the 1912, but don't hold me to that. The batter at the plate, last half of the ninth inning, represented the winning run. And he hit a long drive into the outfield, and he stretched it out, trying to make it into an inside-the-park home run. And as he rounded third base, the throw was coming in from the outfield, and as he crossed the plate, the crowd roared because it was the winning run. But as he crossed the plate, the umpire said, you're out. And the crowd roared its disapproval because they clearly saw he had beaten the throw. And when the, the crowd died down, the umpire said, the reason that he is out is because he did not touch first base. Now, how many of us have been baptized? We've been to second base. How many of us have performed Christian service on third base and we expect to cross the plate and hear, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, as they cross the plate, they say, I prophesied in your name, I healed in your name, I performed miracles in your name, did all these mighty wonderful things in your name. And Jesus says, Depart from me, I never knew you. They didn't touch first base. Now, if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know whether they've touched first base, see us so that we can have you touch that most precious base and invite the real Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your personal Lord and Savior. When we first showed this movie in Sacramento, California at First Baptist Church in, in Fair Oaks, two young men came to see the movie, and I'll even tell you one of them's name, Magdi Salama. He's an Egyptian, a Coptic. His family have been Christian since the 700s. His roommate, a Mormon, is a professional football player. And Magdi started witnessing Jesus to his Mormon roommate, and the Mormon roommate retaliated by giving him a triple combination, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, and Pearl of Great Price. And Magdi was thumbing through the Pearl of Great Price, and he came to some drawings that were supposedly from the Egyptian uh, papyri that Joseph Smith used to translate into the book of Abraham and Magdi started laughing and the Mormon says what are you laughing at he says this is a joke what do you mean a joke he says well it says here this is in Abraham's handwriting he says I learned in the third grade what this is this is from the Egyptian book of the dead that got the Mormon to come see the movie that was on a Friday night he left with an armload of literature which we gave him free the following Monday night, the two of them came to our home for dinner and almost breakfast. The Mormon left with a Safeway paper bag full of books and literature, which we gave to him. To make a long story short, he has asked the real Jesus to be his personal Lord and Savior. And I can hardly wait for him to go public because he's got a great headline. God sent me an Egyptian to lead me out of bondage. <laughs> Larry Mondragon, young high school boy, sharp kid. Christian said, I saw a movie last night. Come and, see with it. Come and see it with me tomorrow night. Tell me if it's true. He came. He was shocked. 
He took the literature which we gave him. He went home. He checked it out in his institute library at, in Sacramento. And he compiled a list of questions which he took to his bishop. And his bishop said, there are no answers to those questions. And Larry looked at him and he says, you have just lost my membership by default. Several weeks later, Dolly Sackett, who is in the temple scene of the, book, of the movie, led him to Jesus in our front room. He's now a Sunday school teacher in that little First Baptist Church in Fair Oaks. I could go on and on and on. I showed the, the movie in the Kapinga Marengi village on the island of Ponape. Four of their people had joined the Mormon church. And we showed the movie. We had a question and answer period following. And with a translator, because some of them <laughs> couldn't really understand English that well. But they asked a question. What were they doing in the movie when they went like that? And as I described it, and other things, they become shocked, became shocked. All of them have left the Mormon church and are safe in the arms of the real Jesus now. I could tell you stories like this from Virginia and Maryland to Guam to Ponape to Truck. Uh, all over the world, these things are happening. And they're precious. These slides have been prepared. They are photographic copies from authoritative Mormon books and documents and they are accepted by Mormons and well known by most Mormons. This first slide, if we can turn these lights down, I see there's a rheostat on that so if you can just dim these lights. Bob, uh, oh he's got it. Very good. This first one is from the book called Mormon Doctrine by Apostle Bruce R. McConkie, page 643. No man can conceive of the glory that may be attained through the resurrection. God himself, the Father of us all, is a glorified, exalted, immortal, resurrected man. Nothing could be more clearly stated than this. He's taking it from the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith and from Doctrine and Covenants, section 130, verse 22. Regarding the relationship between Jesus and Lucifer, this is a book called The Gospel Through the Ages by Milton R. Hunter, one of the uh, general authorities of the Mormon Church, and he says, The appointment of Jesus to be the Savior of the world was con contested by one of the other sons of God. He was called Lucifer, son of the morning, haughty, ambitious, and covetous of power and glory. This spirit brother of Jesus desperately tried to become the savior of mankind. Spirit brother of Jesus. The first two questions in the KISS method, you will have no difficulty with a Mormon in getting a straight answer from them, a yes answer, unless they are deliberately trying to sidestep the question or to deceive you. That does happen occasionally. If that happens, recognize that they can give no other answer than a straight yes and ask the question over and over and over again. Make them answer the question clearly and simply. Don't let them go off into tangents. They're masters at taking you off into irrelevant areas. They major in the minors. They minor in the major. Regarding the paternity of Jesus, how was he conceived? This is from uh, McConkie's book, Mormon Doctrine. It says, God the Father is a perfected, glorified, holy man, an immortal personage, again documenting the Mormon God, and Christ was born into the world as the literal son of this holy being. He was born in the same personal, real, and literal sense that any mortal son is born to a mortal father. There is nothing figurative about his paternity. He was begotten, conceived, and born in the normal and natural course of events, for he is the Son of God, and that designation means what it says. On page 547 of Mormon Doctrine, he says, Begotten means begotten, and Son means Son. Christ was begotten by an immortal Father in the same way that mortal men are begotten by mortal fathers. There is no other conclusion you can come to. It's an act of physical intercourse that destroys the virgin birth. Jesus being married, uh, we're attacked quite often on this issue by Mormons that say this was never taught. This is Jedediah Grant, counselor to Brigham Young in the presidency of the church. This is uh, in the Journal of Discourses, and he is quoting 
a heathen philosopher named Celsus to substantiate that Jesus was married. It says, the grand reason why the Gentiles and philosophers of his school persecuted Jesus Christ was because he had so many wives. There were Elizabeth and Mary and a host of others that followed him. Here's President Orson Hyde, the president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles at the time of Brigham Young, and he says, It will be borne in mind that once on a time there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and on a careful reading of that transaction it will be discovered that no less a person than Jesus Christ was married on that occasion. If he was never married, his intimacy with Mary and Martha and the other Mary also whom Jesus loved, must have been highly unbecoming and improper to say the best of it. Here's a personal letter uh, written to President Joseph Fielding Smith uh, with the following questions. Was Christ married? What is meant by he shall see his seed? Does this mean that Christ had children? And Christ came here to set us the example, and therefore we believe that he must have been married. Are we right? In his own handwrite, handwriting, yes, but do not preach it. The Lord advised us not to cast pearls before swine. We could give you additional documentation on these issues, but we'd be here all night if we covered all of them. We do have over 140 slides of documentation. If uh, in the question and answer period we have other issues we can document. How did the Mormon God come to become a God? In this slide, is represented the very crux of the heresy of Mormon doctrine. It's a doctrine known as the law of eternal progression. In the beginning, Elohim, as they pronounce it, Elohim, his name really is Amon, A-H-M-A-N. Uh, in the beginning, he was raw, unorganized matter or eternal uh, matter. From this, through an act of physical intercourse between his father God and his mother goddess, he became a spirit child in a pre-existent spirit world. He left that spirit world and came to an earth, not this earth, but an earth, and received a mortal body. There he worked out his salvation in fear and trembling, and because he was obedient to all of the laws and ordinances and commandments according to Mormonism, when he died, he went to paradise. And then came the judgment. He rose after the judgment to exaltation in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom and became a god. He went back to the beginning of this cycle with his wife or wives, and procreated spirit children and filled up a pre-existent world to this earth. Some of these spirit children have now come here to this earth, all of us in this room, according to Mormon doctrine, and all Mormons believe that they can work out their exaltation in precisely the same manner as Amon or Elohim did and become a god. Now, where does the Mormon god live? This is uh, volume 6, page 366 of the Authorized History of the Church of the Mormon Church, Joseph Smith speaking. Here then is eternal life, to know the only wise and true God, and you've got to learn how to be gods yourselves and to be kings and priests to God, the same as all gods have done before you, namely by going from one small degree to another and from a small capacity to a great one, from grace to grace, from exaltation to exaltation, until you attain to the resurrection of the dead and are able to dwell in everlasting burnings. Down below, the earthly tabernacle is laid down and dissolved. They shall rise again to dwell in everlasting burnings in immortal glory, to inherit the same power, the same glory, and the same exaltation until you arrive at the station of a God and ascend the throne of eternal power, the same as those who have gone before. Going over to page 366, Joseph Smith still speaking, God Almighty himself dwells in eternal fire. Flesh and blood cannot go there, for all corruption is devoured by the fire. Immortality dwells in everlasting burnings. I will from time to time reveal to you the subjects that are revealed by the Holy Ghost to me. And down below, all men who are immortal dwell in everlasting burnings. If you make it, according to Mormon doctrine, to exaltation, 
you will dwell in eternal fire and everlasting burnings. Who is it that's going to live in everlasting burnings? Satan and his demon spirits and all of those that he captures and leads into everlasting burnings. Now there's one last statement on this page we'd like to show you. Joseph Smith said, I never told you I was perfect, but there is no error in the revelations which I have taught. Let's see. There's chapter 4 of the 1833 Book of Commandments. We have photomechanical reproductions of all of the original editions, the 1833 Book of Commandments, the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, the 1830 Book of Mormon, and the 1851 Pearl of Great Price. We have them here in our briefcases if anybody wants to see them. These changes would have to be made in order to bring the text into conformity with the current edition of the uh, Doctrine and Covenants. Words added, words deleted, textual change, whole sections taken out, whole sections added back in. Here's another page. Whole sections added in. Another page. And we could go on showing slides like this for at least hours. They've even changed the name of their angel. Who knows the name of the angel uh, on the top of the Mormon temples? Moroni? They've changed it. Here is the 1851 edition of the Pearl of Great Price, and Joseph Smith is telling the story. When I first looked, this is up in the top, when I first looked at, upon him, I was afraid. But the fear soon left me. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Nephi. That's scripture. Joseph Smith's mother in the history of Joseph Smith, a biography of Joseph Smith and his progenitors for many generations, Lucy Mack Smith, it's Nephi. Oliver Cowdery said, it's Nephi. And so they've changed it. Now in the scripture it's Moroni, as you can see down below. Now there's another issue that we're attacked on this movie. There's a statement in the movie that says that Joseph Smith had done more than Jesus. And the Mormons claim that we're, we're misquoting section 135, verse 3, which says, Joseph Smith, the prophet and seer of the Lord, has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. The Mormons say we are taking out save Jesus only to make that statement. We're not using section 135 for our documentation. We're using volume 6 of the History of the Church, pages 408 and 409. Joseph Smith speaking. I have more to boast of than ever any man had. I am the only man that has ever been able to keep a whole church together since the days of Adam. A large majority of the whole have stood by me. Neither Paul, John, Peter, nor Jesus ever did it. I boast that no man ever did such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him, but the Latter-day Saints never ran away from me yet. The facts are that eight out of the first twelve apostles either ex were excommunicated or apostatized. Two of them came back into the church. One of them became one of the most bitter enemies the church ever had. And one of them was an enemy for a time, Thomas Marsh. He was rebaptized into the church. And the facts are that this, is, this statement just is not true. If we can have the lights. Now, at this time we'd like to go into the question and answer period. And I want to lay a ground rule for this time. This is to be a question and answer period. Period. It is not to be a forum for the bearing of testimonies, either Mormon or Christian. It is not to be a time period monopolized by any one person in the questioning process. We want everyone to have a chance, and we want to stick to the issue. We don't want to go off into other areas of theology. We want to stick to my experiences in Mormonism, and we also want to avoid personal attacks, the ad hominem attack, which is so fruitless. You ask me a question, and I'll answer the question. I might help have Ken help me. We'll document with slides where, where possible. And I'll repeat the question so everybody can hear if I discern that everybody can't hear. So with that, the only dumb question is the one that's never asked. 
so far away. Okay, Pat Matriciana is the producer of the film. I've talked with him extensively on this. They went to England and they told them that they were making a film, a documentary on the Mormon Church. They were going to have ex-Mormons and anti-Mormons in the film and they wanted to produce a balanced documentary. And they agreed to be filmed and uh, Pat Matriciana has a letter in his file authorizing any of the film that they filmed and they even gave them eight reels of Mormon film and gave authorization to use any part of that. Now, if this was in any way done illegally, the Mormon Church would have filed for an injunction to stop this movie a long time ago because they have owned at least two copies of this film, the video, since about February of 1983, sold to Bonneville International by the producer. They have seen it. If there was anything wrong, they would have stopped it. They have done nothing to stop this film. Any other questions? And if I don't answer any question completely to your satisfaction, please tell me, because I want to make everything clear. Yes, the signs that they make for uh, suffering that your life to be taken, are these uh, signs evidencing ways that your life may be taken for revealing these uh, secrets? Yes, they are. Have threats been made concerning this? I have 12 cassette tapes with death threats and obscenities on our incoming answer phone. We have had uh, our apartment egged. We've had a dead snake and a dead uh, iguana plopped on our doorstep. I've had my car royally decorated on two occasions with eggs, oil, uh, syrup, uh, Kool-Aid powder on one occasion, and the little sprinkly colored things you put on cookies on another occasion. The last time they tried to super glue my doors closed on my car, that didn't work. They have no difficulty finding my car. My license plate says ex-Mormon. And they love it in Salt Lake. They clap, thumbs up one way. Uh, they really like it in Salt Lake. I, you know, I have no secrets from any of the Mormons. Uh, they know my phone number. The missionaries come by my home. Missionaries call me. Uh, we have open dialogue. Uh, I propose to many Mormons you know, if we're going to disagree, let's agree to disagree agreeably. But let's talk. Don't take the ostrich approach and stick your head in the sand and say, I don't want to hear about it or read about it or even think about it. That's tragic. Any other questions? Is the temple ritual patterned after the Masonic ritual? It has been taken from the Masonic ritual. Joseph Smith was a Mason. He went from entered apprentice to master mason in less than 24 hours at sight. And uh, within days after they kicked all the Mormons out of the Masonic Lodge in Illinois, they instituted the endowment ceremony over the room of Joseph Smith's store, and it was Masonic through and through. The marks over the garments and the veil in the temple are from the Masonic... Uh, the square and the compass. You have many Masonic uh, symbols on the uh, temple. Uh, the Nauvoo temple even had a Masonic weather vane on top of it. Any other questions? Okay, good question. The beliefs seem so preposterous and unbelievable. Why do so many people believe it? I've spent a great deal of time thinking about this. I have a degree in sociology and a minor in psychology. And with my study, I've come to the conclusion it's because of one single word, greed. They want to become a god or a goddess. And they live with the hope that they can become exalted and become a god or a goddess. And 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 to 12 makes that very clear. Because of that greed, they have brought themselves under strong delusion from God. That's why so many temple Mormons are almost impossible to reach. It is strong delusion. Now, the formula for reaching them is we sow the seed. We water the seed with prayer. God gives the increase. 
our problem is the same problem Abraham had. We don't understand God's timing, and we want to rush it. And many people want to make it seem worse than it is. You know, if you've got the wrong God and the wrong Jesus, how much worse can you get? That's fatal. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what is the Adam God theory? Uh, on September 9, 1852, Joe, or Brigham Young started the Adam God doctrine going when he said, I'll, uh, he said, uh, Adam is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. That started it. And there it is. Uh, he is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. Up to uh, his death in 1877, Brigham Young taught it, and we have so many uh, references of where he taught it right up to... <coughs> 1873 said, and I'm, I'm calling from memory, how much unbelief exists in the hearts and minds of Latter-day Saints over one particular doctrine that I taught, namely that Adam is our Father and our God. Uh, David John Berger in spring issue of Dialogue uh, 1983, 82, 1982, wrote an extensive article on the Adam-God issue and it is irrefutable. Brigham Young taught it. Now, this brings up an interesting question. Mormons say, oh, my producer says, let's show you a slide. Oh, here we have Mormon apostle uh, Bruce R. McConkie, living Mormon apostle today, in a personal letter to uh, Professor Eugene England at Brigham Young University, February 19, 1981, and he says, yes, President Young did teach that Adam was the father of our spirits and all the related things that the cultists ascribed to him. This, however, is not true. He expressed views that are out of harmony with the gospel, but be it known, Brigham Young also taught accurately and correctly the status and position of Adam in the etern eternal scheme of things. What I am saying is that Brigham Young contradicted Brigham Young and the issue becomes one of which Brigham Young we will believe. <laughs> Excuse me. The answer is we will believe the expressions that accord with the teachings and the standard works. Now, many Mormons are attacking us on issues in this film and saying these were never doctrines in the Mormon church. They're not in harmony with the standard works of the church. Okay. If they were never doctrines, and, and we'll show you that some of these were doctrines, if it was not a doctrine, what was it? A teaching, a precept, a concept, an idea, a theory. And if any of these issues, like Bruce R. McConkie says, under the section called heresy, in the true gospel sense, any opinion or doctrine in opposition to the revealed word of the Lord is recorded in the standard works of the church and is taught by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is an heresy. The issue is not how many people uh, may believe a teaching, it is whether the doctrine is true or false. Now, let's look up in the other column. Heresy is false doctrine. So, the problem is, if Brigham Young was teaching that Adam was God, then it's heresy. He's a false prophet. There is no other conclusion. It's inescapable. If Orson Pratt or Orson Hyde taught that Jesus was married, it's heresy. And he was a false apostle. And any of these issues taught by these men if they're not in harmony with what the Mormons call the standard works of the church, the Bible, the Book of Mormon, the, the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, then it's heresy. And what we're saying is the Mormon church is riddled with prophets and apostles that are teaching heresy. And the most fatal heresy is that God was a glorified, resurrected, exalted man, that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer, and if you've got the wrong God and the wrong Jesus, everything else is irrelevant. That's the issue we want to impress upon every person. That's the issue that's the real issue. That's the issue that's the fatal issue. Everything else is nickels, noise, and nonsense. 
Oh, false doctrines are from beneath. Just going on with McConkie. <laughs> Their effect is to pervert, change, and alter revealed truth so that by obeying false directions, men will fall short of salvation in the celestial world. Down below, false doctrines abound in churches which deny contemporary revelation and consequently have no sure way of checking various views and concepts to see if they conform to the mind and will of deity. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, there, who really wrote the Book of Mormon? That's the title of a book by uh, three authors. And uh, there are several theories about where the Book of Mormon came from. One of them is that it came from a book or a manuscript written by uh, a preacher named Solomon Spaulding. It's called Manuscript Story. This manuscript is in the Oberlin College Library in Ohio. Up until recently, I have taken a very non-committal uh, position on Solomon Spaulding. But recently, there's a new book written by Vernell Hawley uh, outlining the parallels between Manuscript Story and the Book of Mormon, and there's some very interesting information that he has uh, discovered. Here's a map of New York. Here's Palmyra, where Joseph Smith started the Mormon Church. These names, underlined in red, are names of towns and communities. Maybe if we can just dim the lights here, they can see a little better. Uh, and you can leave the lights dimmed because I can see the people. Here's the names of towns and communities that existed in Joseph Smith's time. Rama, Moran, Agath, down on the right, Oneida, Angola in the middle, Moravanton over on the left, uh, down on the lower right, Lehi, uh, Shiloh, which is hard to see right there, Alma, Jerusalem, and so forth. These are only a few of the names. We have many, many more. These blue line names are Book of Mormon communities. And look up at the top. Rama, Rama. Moran, Moran. Agath, Ogath. Oneida, Oneida. Moravanton, Morianton. Angola is the same, up in the middle, right above New York, yeah. Uh, Jerusalem's the same, Alma, Valley of Alma, Shiloh, Shilom, Lehi, Nephi, or Lehi becomes Lehi, Nephi, and so forth. We have many, many more names that we could put on here, but it would become too busy for you to, to really understand it. Now, look at the geography. Sea east, sea west, land northward, land southward, and the narrow neck of land with many fortifications that exist in that area today. I believe it's becoming fairly close to the time period where we're going to be able to make a much more dogmatic statement about Solomon Spaulding. Uh, Ken, if you leave that on, uh, we can see. Uh, there's another book called View of the Hebrews by Ethan Smith. I can tell you positively it is connected to the Book of Mormon even Mormon Apostle B.H. Roberts wrote a several hundred page book outlining the parallels between View of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. You have whole chapters of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon, so the Bible is a source. Uh, Joseph Smith was surrounded by people like Sidney Rigdon, W.W. Phelps, Oliver Cowdery, people with intellect and with uh, ability to put this story together. So the, the last statement I will make about the Book of Mormon, we know that God had no part in the creation of the Book of Mormon whatsoever. Any other questions? Okay, I announced in the beginning that the temple ceremony scene is a reenactment scene. It was not filmed in a Mormon temple. It was filmed in a temple, the Masonic Temple, ironically, in Hollywood. And uh, it's a reenactment scene, and it's very, very accurate. Very accurate, yes. Why wouldn't Mormons... Well, this young lady says she is an ex-Mormon, and she never read this while she was a Mormon. Why can't Mormons see this? Well, basically, it's because most Mormons never read it. And, and your delusion is such that the, the fatal things that you're literally... The ironic thing is they're being taught the truth in their own material, and they don't understand it but most Mormons never even see it. 
Let's see what, compare what it says in Mosiah 27, uh, verse 28. Nevertheless, after waiting through much tribulation, repenting nigh unto death, the Lord in mercy hath seen fit to snatch me out of an everlasting burning, and I am born of God. So here's a major contradiction between the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's teaching. And this is a, a pattern. You find these incredible contradictions all the way through Mormonism and discrepancies. Uh, from the first vision story, eight different stories, the, the, uh, when Joseph Smith was killed, eight revelations surfaced as to who was to become the next prophet, seer, and revelator. One of those was to his son, Joseph Smith III, in a blessing that has recently been rediscovered in January 1981, proving that if Joseph Smith is a true prophet, the reorganized church has the true authority. The text of this blessing is in my KISS method of witnessing. Here's a photograph of the blessing. I believe it's one of the most uh, un indefensible false prophecies of Joseph Smith or prophetic utterances. Verily thus saith the Lord, if, and this is the blessing to Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith III, by the laying on of hands. Verily thus saith the Lord, if he abides in me, his days shall be lengthened upon the earth, but if he abides not in me, I, the Lord, will receive him in an, in, in an instant unto myself. The facts are he did not abide in the Utah church. He became the president of the reorganized church in 1862, and he outlived Brigham Young. He was 82 years of age when he died. That's pretty hard to defend as being a true prophetic utterance. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What were the circumstances of Joseph Smith's death? Uh, he died in the Carthage, Illinois jail on uh, July 27th, 1844, as I remember. And here from the History of the Church, Volume 7, uh, let's read it, page 101. Sometime after dinner we sent for some wine. It has been reported by some that this was taken as a sacrament. It was no such thing. Our spirits were generally dull and heavy, and it was sent for to revive us. This is in violation of section 89, the, the, the uh, uh, word of wisdom, that they are not to partake of these things. This is John Taylor telling this. Uh, he was in the jail. And he was an apostle and later became the president of the Mormon church. I shall never forget the deep feeling of sympathy and regard manifested in the countenance, countenance of Brother Joseph as he drew nigh to Hiram and leaning over him exclaimed, Oh, my dear, dear brother Hiram. He, however, instant, he had, Hiram had just been shot. A ball came through the door and hit Hiram in the forehead and he exclaimed, I am a dead man and fell dead. Uh, Let's see, he, uh, he, Joseph Smith, however, instantly arose and with a firm, quick step and a determined expression of countenance, approached the door and pulling the six-shooter left by Brother Wheelock from his pocket, opened the door slightly and snapped the pistol six successive times. Only three of the barrels, however, were discharged. I afterwards understood that two or three were wounded by this discharges, two of whom I am informed died. The Mormon Church will teach you that Joseph Smith died as a martyr. Does a martyr die in a blazing gun battle? If we can hit those lights again, it's a little <laughs> awkward. Uh, a martyr doesn't die in a blazing gun battle. He voluntarily lays down his life. Yes. Is the history of the church a document which they uh, support? Very interesting question. This was a major problem I had in studying the Tanner's book, one of the charges is that over 60% of the church history was not written by Joseph Smith. It was written by other people who later transferred the language from third person to first person and now has been presented in the Mormon church's history book as first person Joseph Smith telling the story. In the answer to the Tanner's book, by the, the uh, anonymous church historian, I have a copy of that with me, he said regarding this charge, and I'll quote it, this is certainly all true, and as an historian I regret the confusion that it has caused. Over 60% of the history of the church in their history book was not written by Joseph Smith. It has been changed. And so the scholarly Mormons 
don't trust the history. They always go back to original documents where possible. This was the kind of research that I did because I had learned of this discrepancy as much as possible. I went back to original documents to check it and uh, the history cannot be trusted. They see what they want to see in order to support their own position or greed. Yes, that's exactly true. Yes, sir. Good question. What is the fate of those who fail to reach godhood or exaltation? Well, they can go to the terrestrial kingdom. We'll have a slide up here in a second. Back to the uh, law of eternal progression. If you don't make it to exaltation, you go to the terrestrial kingdom if you've been a good person. And that's where all Christians go, honorable men who did not accept Mormonism. That's where all Mormons go who were not capable of uh, obeying every single commandment. Now when you think about that, we're all going the same place anyway according to Mormon doctrine. Now all the bad people, the liars and murderers and whoremongers and so forth, they go to the telestial kingdom. It is still a degree of glory. The difference between the three is who rules or is present in the kingdom. Elohim and Jesus can both be present in the celestial kingdom. Jesus can be present in the terrestrial kingdom, not Elohim. God can't go there, doesn't go there. The Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit can be present in the telestial kingdom, but neither Jesus nor Elohim can be present in the telestial kingdom. There is another place down in the lower right. Uh, it's called the second death. That's where I go, according to written Mormon doctrine. I am a son of perdition. And this becomes interesting because written Mormon doctrine says I am a son of perdition because I am speaking out against the, the Mormon church. Mormon leaders that I know, high Mormon leaders, friends of mine, former clients of mine say, no, you didn't have enough knowledge of Mormonism to have rejected it. And so we come to a catch-22 situation. And this becomes interesting. Ken will grab that here in a second and we'll show it to you. <laughs> this will be from Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith. And it's a real catch-22 situation. And I'll read. This is Doctrines of Salvation by Joseph Fielding Smith. And he quotes, he says, Joseph Smith taught a plurality of gods and that man by obeying the commandments of God and keeping the whole law will eventually reach the power and exaltation by which he also will become a god. Going down... <laughs> We've got to accept every covenant that he gives us if we want exaltation. And as pertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, it was instituted for the fullness of my glory, and that and he that receiveth a fullness thereof must and shall abide the law, or he shall be damned, saith the Lord God. Now, there is a clear-cut definition in detail of the new and everlasting covenant. It is everything the fullness of the gospel. So marriage properly performed, baptism, ordination to the priesthood, everything else, every contract, every obligation, every performance that pertains to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise according to his law here given, is a part of the new and everlasting covenant. Going on, in other words, those who will not make their lives conform in every particular to the divine life, who will not adjust their lives through faith and repentance and obedience to all divine law, will never be in a position to comprehend truth in its fullness. Now, stop for a moment and think of that. The only way that you can comprehend truth in its fullness is to be obedient to all law. The only way that you can reach the celestial kingdom is to obey all truth. Now look at the next statement. Therefore, only in the celestial kingdom will the fullness of the truth be attained. You can't reach it unless you obey all truth, but you'll never learn all truth until you get to the celestial kingdom. It's catch-22. It's impossible. 
Any other question? <coughs> How do the Mormons rationalize the discrepancy between the Bible and the Book of Mormon and other of their scriptures? There are so many discrepancies. Well, let's, to begin with, show what the Mormon Church believes about its Bible. The eighth article of faith out of the thirteen articles of faith today says, We believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. So wherever the Bible and Mormon doctrine are not in harmony, the Bible is suspect as having been mistranslated. They have a very low uh, opinion of the Bible because they say wicked scribes changed it. So most Mormons do not really study the discrepancies between their doctrines. We have a book written by Jim and Judy Robertson and an organization in Mesa, Arizona called Concerned Christians. And in one column it shows Mormon doctrine, in another column it shows Mormon scripture, and then the Bible. And in most of the major doctrinal areas of Mormonism, you find that the Bible and the Book of Mormon disagree with current Mormon doctrine. And you'll find that of, in the Book of Mormon, which was supposed to be the most perfect book ever written, uh, you won't find uh, many of the major doctrinal issues. Well, here my producer's up with me. I told the brethren, this is Joseph Smith speaking, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. Well, there's a list of 14 doctrines that are very important doctrines in Mormonism that you will not find in the Book of Mormon. Now, we can make these lists available to you. In fact, Bob Witte is the author of a book called Where Does It Say That? And uh, all of these uh, references uh, regarding these heretical teachings of Mormonism can be found in his book, Where Does It Say That? And they are photographs of the actual Mormon books. And so the Mormon can't say this is anti-Mormon literature. It's their own material. And so you can go to those books and find this. One last question. Yes. How do the Mormons uh, justify the inconsistency between their doctrines and teachings and, and so forth? They usually take what I call the ostrich approach. They don't try to justify it. They stick their head in the sand and they say, I don't want to read about it or study about it. It hurts them that we should point it out. You know, I spent many years as a very advanced financial planner, a financial ergonomist, and uh, I dealt with people who had been swindled out of a lot of money. And it hurts to learn that you've been swindled out of over a million dollars like one of my clients. And you don't even want to admit that you've been swindled. He, to this day, will not admit that these guys were con, con artists. Even though I've got one of them uh, uh, almost under indictment by the IRS uh, because of his activities. I think... Oh, let's... <coughs> Here is from Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation. It says, Inspiration is discovered in the fact that each part, as it was revealed, this is the revelations, dovetailed perfectly with what had come before. There was no need for eliminating, changing, or adjusting any part to make it fit. But each new revelation on doctrine and priesthood fitted in its place perfectly to complete the whole structure as it had been prepared by the master builder. Going over, it says, in a book writ written by Hugh Nibley, one of the giant scholars of the Mormon Church, called No Ma'am, That's Not History. It's an answer to uh, Fawn Brody's book, uh, No Man Knows My History. And here he says, The gospel as the Mormons know it sprang full-grown from the words of Joseph Smith. It has never been worked over or touched up in any way and is free of revisions and alterations. This is a bald-faced, blatant lie. This is what Mormons are being taught, you see. And they're being taught to follow the words of a living prophet. And the words of a living prophet take precedence over that of past leaders and the Bible and the Book of Mormon. This is a speech by uh, Ezra Taft Benson. Now, if they're willing to swallow that, they're lost. They're, there's no foundation. They've taken the foundation, which is the Word of God, and just thrown it out. Say, it's the living prophet that, re that rules. 
Well, we've got only one last question. I'll take it. The, uh, wasn't there something in the 40s? In 1945, the, ho the, the ward teacher's message from the first presidency said, when the leaders speak, the thinking has been done. In August or September, and here's that slide, uh, June 1945, my producer has the fastest fingers in the West. I see you out there shaking your head, son. How is he doing this? Yeah. Uh, We've done this, incidentally, about 300 times, and uh, it, we've heard you know, just about every question that can be asked. We've heard about every attack that can be made, and uh, we've, it's uh, interesting. June 1945, Improvement Era, says, When our leaders speak, the thinking has been done. When they propose a, <laughs> excuse me, when they propose a plan, it is God's plan. When they point the way, there is no other which is safe. When they give direction, it should mark the end of controversy. God works in no other way. To think otherwise without immediate repentance may cost one his faith, may destroy his testimony, and leave him a stranger to the kingdom of God. Now, let's go down here in the letter by Bruce R. McConkie to Eugene England. Uh, this letter, incidentally, was chastising uh, Dr. England because he was teaching a doctrine that uh, was taught in the Mormon Church that God progresses in knowledge. And uh, so here's what uh, McConkie says, and the Adam-God issue uh, that Dr. England was teaching. He says, it is your province to echo what I say or to remain silent. You do not have a divine commission to correct me or any of the brethren. Going down, if I lead the church astray, that is my responsibility. But the fact still remains that I am the one appointed with all the rest involved so to do. The appointment is not given to the faculty at Brigham Young, Ur Brigham Young University or to any of the members of the church. The Lord's house is a house of order, and those who hold the keys are appointed to proclaim the doctrines. Now, I hope you will ponder and pray and come to a basic understanding of fundamental things and that unless and until you can on all points you will remain silent on those where differences exist between you and the brethren. This is the course of safety. I advise you to pursue it. If you do not, perils lie ahead. It is not too often in this day that any of us are told plainly and bluntly what ought to be. I am taking the liberty of so speaking to you at this time and become thus a witness against you if you do not take the counsel. That sounds like a threat to me. Now, let me emphasize, tonight's question and answer period is totally different than tomorrow night's and every night this week because the questions are different. And we respond to what people ask us. And you might come back tomorrow night or one of the other nights. It really gets interesting, especially if we can get Mormons talking to us. And I can promise the Mormons... We will not put them down. We will not take cheap shots at them. We will not embarrass them. We'll just point out if they are wrong. So come back tonight. Tell your neighbors and your friends uh, what you saw tonight because we can come to a city and we can reach a group like tonight, but we can't reach the whole city. But if you will become involved, you see, then it proliferates and it goes forth into the whole world. And if you can become a member of Ezekiel's band and learn to blow the trumpet, then you see we will reach Mormon people. Not until. We need your help. <laughs>